morning, everyone. Uh, before, before we get to the sermon, I thought I'd, I'd just checked with Monica and it's okay to mention, just so we have some context, that uh, little Sebastian's father passed away this week in an accident. So, um, yeah, they're really grieving. Sebastian's grieving. Monica, for Michael, for Isabel, Matteo, um, and the rest of the family. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just we come before you, and, and we acknowledge that you are God. You you are a Father who loves so deeply. You love your children, and you love little Sebastian. You love Monica and and Isabel and Matteo and and Michael and Jeremiah, Matthias and uh, Monica. Lord, you love that whole family. We, we, we just pray that you would put your arms around them as they grieve at this time. May you uphold them. May they know you and your presence with them. May they just be encouraged. Lord, and may, may uh, they all just have such a, a comfort and peace that they can only acknowledge as being the Lord Jesus. We just pray that we would see the good come out of this torrid time. And uh, Lord, we just rejoice in you. And we rejoice in your word that's going to be unfold. We pray that each of us would turn our hearts and minds to what you have to say to us. Lord, that your spirit wants to speak to us. Your spirit wants to be with us. Your spirit wants to, to allow us to experience everything that you've got for us. And I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart. I pray that you would open our souls to fully receive you and let you take hold of every part of our lives. In your name. Amen. So we're turning uh, to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 5 to about living um, in a life worthy of Christ. Walking in that, as, as, as John mentioned earlier, walk, walk, walk that we see through it in, in the ESV. In the NIV, you'll see live, live, live. So it's, it's the pattern of life, it's the walk. We'll, we'll get to that later on in this as well, uh, this section. But there is a lot, there's a lot of chunks in this section. And we're just going to zip through some. So forgive me, we won't hit it all, but you know, so many verses in the Bible, you could just sit on by themselves for half an hour. You know, every time I come to prepare the word, I, I get really nervous, but I get excited at the same time because it's so full and so rich. And I go, how can I get up there and speak if I just want to sit with it, you know? Um, the word of God stands on its own, but God does use us to impart the message. And, and, and let's see what God imparts today for us all. It's his word. And Paul starts off, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. So I'm reading from the NIV. And I insist on it in the Lord. I insist, I testify, I declare. This is strong language, much to say, I urge you. I am, pay attention to this, this is, this is crucial. So what do we do? We've got to pay attention. We want to be listening to Paul. And he says, I insist on it in the Lord. He's giving the authority of the Lord in this. So pay attention. That you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. The Gentiles, you Jews and Gentiles, the, the Gentiles were the unbelievers, the pagans, particularly in Ephesus around the, the goddess Diana, and that's what people would have been coming for. But it's it's about the unbelievers. Don't be like, don't no longer live, no longer walk as the Gentiles do. So there's that word live, walk, that the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Hmm. Futility. That's a that's a, a, a lovely word that uh, I, I know some people, you know, fatality and futility, I've seen things get mixed up like that in sermons before. And it's, it's one of those words, though, that's a really strong word, futility. It, what, what it's meaning is, is purposelessness. It's, it's, it's pointless. It's, it's worthless. It's void of meaning, meaningless, empty. And in this thinking, there's a thinking that's warped. There's a problem here with the thinking. This empty thinking, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't wander around without out the point to your life. Uh, 
And the reflection, the analysis, isn't really hitting the core of the problem. You've got a futility of your thinking, and, and you can read Romans chapter 1, verse 21 to 32, that it's not the sin, is the problem is in the thinking. And Paul's saying you've got it all wrong in your thinking if you live as a Gentile. You know, it's a bit like when you, you live life and you do the same old things over and over again. You mow the lawn week after week, you mow the lawn week after week, and if there's no purpose to it, gee, it gets boring. I mean, it gets boring. So, you know, all hard work, you just don't feel like getting up and doing the mowing. Or if you're doing cleaning, you know, you clean the house and the next week, you know, it's still sparkling. But no. You know what I mean? It, it, it goes around and it goes around and it goes around. Can you imagine living this life? without we're doing these jobs day after day. Or you might get a bigger house, more mowing, more cleaning. That's the ambition for everyone, isn't it? Get a bigger house to get more mowing and more cleaning. But you go around and live life in this circle, this futile circle, for what point? To get a bigger house? Or maybe that you can invest in your family so they can get a bigger house and do more mowing and more cleaning. Oh, lovely, isn't it? Futile? What is it if we have no God? What if God's not part of this? I simplify it very, very humorously, but <coughs> simplifying it is really actually just saying, actually, that hurts to think that we've got family members and friends who are living in the futility, the thinking, acquiring possessions and, and making things comfortable for the family and making us all happy, in inverted commas, that that is the point to life and it is very much despairing. So Paul said, get your thinking right. Don't be repetitive and meaningless. The lament of Ecclesiastes, all things done under the sun are meaningless. The, 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 the human life to the exclusion of God Things like human wisdom that he, that he talks about, work, acquiring things, life itself, competition, power and authority, the love of money, wealth, possessions, honour and recognition, ho-hum religion throughout Ecclesiastes. So reading from 17 to 22, Let's just have a look at that futility. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires walk no longer walk like the Gentiles there's a pattern of thinking of living and you know how do you learn to walk you learn to walk one step after the other don't you so it's left right okay you practice that got it once left right got it twice left right got it three times great now go on with the on. off Put off the old self, put on the new self. Put on the old self, off the old self, put on the new self. <laughs> See, you're going to keep that in your head all week now, aren't you? Put off the old self, put on the new self. Do you see? We have a walk of life where we're learning those two steps. There's two steps that we have in the Christian walk. And if, you, if you're going walking and you're like me and, and you know, a long walk, you get tired and you, you've got to start keeping your mind on every part of your body that's aching because, you know, I was born with two thirds torso and one third legs. And walking is an absolute nightmare, you know? And you, you get to that point where you're really aching, you know what I mean? And it's 10 metres down. Um, and then you're really sore, and you just gotta keep thinking, I've gotta keep going, you know, you've gotta do those steps. 
and, and you go, okay, now instead of going left, right, you're going, put off the old self, put on the new self. Yeah. Walking is going to be so much fun, you're going to grow spiritually as well as athletically. <laughs> The old self of the futility and destructive thinking, the corrupt and rotten way of life. Put on the new self and the new in the attitude of your mind created, as it says, they're created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The world has an empty, pointless goal. They are intellectually ignorant, emotionally impotent, spiritually immature, inert, we see darkness versus light. We see separation versus being with God. We see being hard versus being loyal to our Heavenly Father and willing to do what He wants us to do. We see an insensitivity, a numbness to conscience, a numbness to soul versus a heart that is open to God. In verse 19 it says, Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Given over, so gone beyond, um, gone in the direction of just shutting off, to given over to sensuality. I can tell you that even in the church, people are given over to sensuality. One of the greatest things is that we've gone from, like the greed, which encompasses all kinds of sin, the love of money is the root of all evil, and as the Jews said, uh, idolatry is the root of all evil. We've got these things, but but we've got, um, but it's this the sensuality. It's given over. The best thing that we describe is like you've got the love of money. You, you want to pursue possessions. You want to pursue things that you can get that, that make you feel good, that that look good, that encourage a comfortable life. And you and you see people these days that can't even buy a house. So what do you say to spend money on? will a lot more spend money on experiences because both ways are trying to make a life that is pleasurable and comfortable by the what we do and what we invest our money into, what we invest our effort into. But God is saying invest your effort, invest your money, invest yourself into me. It may not always feel comfortable. You may have to go through suffering, in fact you will go through suffering. But what I want you to know is the joy of the Lord when you renew and, and your, your mind in Christ, when you renew yourself in Christ, when you're restored by God, and then you're restored to me, you're with me, you walk with me. Oh, the delight that is to be found in me. God is calling us to himself. It's all about Jesus. Do you know, individually, we're putting on the new self. It's a new self at salvation. We're putting on corporately, but we keep putting on the new self. But corporately, as a body, as a body of Christ, we're being renewed. As a body of Christ, we're changing. Because, yes, the primary thing, the primary thing is a direction toward the individual, but it's also speaking here corporately as, as the church changes puts on its new self and together becomes the body of Christ in a new and living way, vigorous for the community and for each other and to serve and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not forget what we're doing, not just individually, but how we impact each other. New in the attitude of your minds, it says there. That new in the attitude of your minds, in, in, that's new in the spirit of your minds. And then you get the sense that the Holy Spirit is directing this, which the Holy Spirit is. Holy Spirit is directing this in our minds. So we ask, who is in control of our mind? Am I in control of my mind? Is the devil in control of my mind? Is the spirit in control of my mind? And Paul is saying, be like God, conforming unto Christ, who is the true righteousness and holiness. <coughs> then we get to <coughs> verse 25, where it says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, 
for we are all members of one body. Truth. We should be a group of people known for speaking the truth. We function as a body under the headship of Christ properly, the best, most effectively, the only way when we function under Christ, when we walk in truth, when we put away, put off falsehood, lies, exaggeration, stretching the truth, when yes is yes and no is no. And when hard one again, when promises are kept and integrity is upheld in the truth and speaking truthfully to one another and being cautious of what we say and what we pass on, that it be the truth and it be used for good. Also, in how we relate to and are seen by people outside the church, are we a people of integrity? It is an important part of sharing the gospel to be seen as people of integrity. How effective is it when you're seen as a person of integrity? How effective is it when you're seen as a group of people who together have integrity? It's important for Christians to be reliable in this way, to have true righteousness and holiness. With truth, we trust one another and others trust us. It's crucial, it's fundamental for healthy relationships, but also for imparting hope. And then we get to, in your anger do not sin, or in some, be angry and do not sin. There is an anger that's okay. There is a righteous anger that oh, that's okay. Jesus had a righteous anger and showed us how that was done. Be careful though, you're not Jesus. Be careful that you don't think, oh, my anger is righteous. Border on the, I would say, border on the being over self-controlled, keeping it in check, but keep seeking God. What is righteous anger? The attitudes, your attitudes and reflections they require a very careful consideration before God. We do not sin. Do not sin in your anger. Bring your anger to God. Do not repress your anger. Resolve it in the Lord Jesus. Sometimes we think, I won't be angry. <coughs> I'm not getting angry at you. I just hate you. <coughs> but, or you go, I'm okay. And you end up with an ulcer. You know, it's those sorts of things. Don't, let's keep bringing it to God. Let's keep checking it before God. What is this anger? Be obedient. Daily service in the Lord means giving over your anger. If it spurs us on in righteous, ju righteousness, justice and holy action, then we are motivated to move forward. And that would be a good reason for anger that God would compel in us a righteous attitude and a just attitude in the right way, in the way that God would do it. Not that we would seek vengeance, not that we would be the punish makers, punishment makers, but that we would seek to see how God would spur us on in this. If it spurs us on to be proactive in our faith, to protect others, to support others, to break through with the gospel light in the midst of darkness, then this is the anger that is needed. But God directed and like God. So be angry if the occasion requires it. But I'd be cautious. That would be rarity. And it spurs us on, you know, I think of things such as the Born Alive Bill that make me angry. But it spurs me on to pray. It spurs, I haven't gone to, to being proactive about that, but there's so many things. And, and my heart in this is to just commit this before the Lord. Um, if you want to talk about the Born Alive, if you're wondering about what I mean, it's um, when babies are aborted and they're still alive and they're left to die, that this bill to be brought in is that we will, the babies will have to be attended to and cared for. See, that, that gets my heart. To think that people could leave babies to die, that makes me angry. Am I there ready to take someone's head off? Actually, no. But it spurs me to pray because I've got something that stirs in my heart and walks with God in it. And I say, don't let me get angry at the politicians. Sometimes, yes, I do. 
I will confess that yes, I do. I do get angry at politicians for certain things and when they clap uh, over abortion, I get, and yes, I know people have gone through abortion and God is the forgiving God who loves and wants to put his arms around us. I am not saying that, I am not saying he pain, but I am saying something stir up in our hearts that we wouldn't be a, a, a passive people either, that we wouldn't be dormant when God wants us to rise up, that we wouldn't stop praying when he wants us to commit to prayer, that there would be something happening in us, but that it, he would be directing us by his word and by the spirit, that we would Check it by the scriptures. <clears throat> Must be personal. Pers per um. But angering God, it, it must be purposeful and it must not endure. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Be obedient and resolve it in God. Warning, don't give the devil a foothold. It is not to consume you. Are you in control of your anger in Christ, even in righteous anger? The next part. Anyone who's, who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk... No, I'll go... Something to share with those in need. Full stop. Take a breath, Byron. Don't steal. Don't be using government money without good reason. Don't be dishonest with taxes. There's a whole lot of things that we could cover in this area. Work diligently. Work honestly. Let's not be lazy. Let's not be greedy. See, you, you sit here and you go, there's a do not be this, do not be that, do not be this, do not be that. And we go, oh, it's such a heavy, critical, convicting sermon. And, you know, and no, no, no. No, 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 no. God is saying... You could be just a fantastic community that everyone loves to be with, but you've got these problems. Let's just pick them up and dump them out, hey? And then we will be heading towards that fantastic community that I want to be with. You're my body. I want to be with you. I don't want you to be having all this mess. Let's clean up. Clean up house. I'm not saying, no, 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 because I just love it. I mean, I do love it with my... No, I don't love it with my kids. God has a heart for us. He has the heart for us to thrive and, and delight in him. So wonderful. Let's keep working at it. Let's keep loving each other, being patient with one another. But you also have to work to the point of having enough to share with one another. See, it's not about just working to live this cyclical life. It's about living to let others thrive in their lives as well and to see that we all come into, into the body under the headship of Christ. We want to be a steward of God. Sharing creates community. People thrive. People learn to trust. People love. People heal. Speaking truthfully. And then it goes on to 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of, the, out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That unwholesome talk, that unwholesome word that in some versions is evil or corrupting or corrupt. It means spoiled or rotten, like fish that's gone off or, or rotten fruit. But animal or vegetable matter, that, that is spoiled, you know. Have you ever opened up the fridge and gone, oh, something's off in here? Or, or have you ever opened up, I don't know, we have a little compost bucket and you open up, oh, you know. Or, or, you know, I don't know, a high schooler's bag and you open up and there's a two-week-old <laughs> lunch in there. And you're, oh. That's exactly what God's talking about when he, it's a putrid thing. He's not saying, do not let unho uh, um, unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Don't open up and be like the bag or the box or the fridge and just be this putrid smell. That's what God's saying. Watch what we say. In James 1.26 it says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues to see themselves and their religion is worthless. And, and in the actually in the trivia night, we had a question on this, but yeah, uh, what movie did this come from? Well, I didn't know, but it's from Bambi, and it's a quote from Thumper. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. In, 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 in that, you know, it's, we have things that are in scripture that are truths that we see throughout. 
let's be cautious of what we say, that it be useful for building one another up, building the community. And then we get to all these things, we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm a bit concerned here, I may need my mic turned down for this part. <laughs> Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, that grief, what I, what I think, say and do can hurt God. I see my kids at times making unwise decisions, harmful decisions, pain, you know. Do things ever, you know, people that you love that ever impact you, what they're doing? Even friends or people in the community, work colleagues or... I know when I see my kids wandering from Jesus, I pray and scream out at the top of my lungs, oh God, I could be heard. I don't care. The pain is so hard when we have someone that we love that is wandering away. And you see all the junk that we bring into church, all the junk that we have in our lives, we have a Holy Spirit that is going, oh, come on. Don't read me. Don't let me see you wandering. Come back and enjoy a relationship with me. You see, I think we see God as something of distant. God's not distant. That care says that he's going to love us as father in a way that we can't ever love as parents, in a way that we could never love anyone. And he wants us to have that beautiful relationship like we can't even think, like we can't imagine, like we can't even presume to imagine. We want to think that no, it's not as good as it's not as good. I want to go my own way because it's not really that good. Well, it's fantastic. That grief is to distress or grief. It's a to experience deep emotional pain. That word can mean severe to sorrow, very intense pain, even a pain that's used in to explain childbirth. That is the intensity of pain to grieve Holy Spirit. God is communicating the depth of his sorrow, conviction and communication with us. You know, I hated disappointing my parents. I hated hurting them. What we do to our Heavenly Father, you know, one of the things that I love is that it actually impacts them. It shows that they, for my, it impacted my parents. It showed me that they loved me. It impacts Holy Spirit to say, I want to show you my love. Not in the way that we would think. I think we've got to be cautious about how we're impacting yeah. that, yeah. Lots of good conversations, but yeah. Not because he is condemning, but he wants us to know how good life is when we walk with him. How good community is when we walk with him. How good church is when we walk with him. How delightful it is in him. Be imitators of God, uh, following the model and example, copying the Lord Jesus Christ. In the world, we imitate the world. In the word, we imitate the word. But let us walk, live to please God. Walk with him in love. Love despite your feelings. Sometimes God says love and you go, how can I love that person? Don't go on your feelings. Go because God commanded you and he's got something great and he will bring you to that point. Sacrifice because God asks us to give up. Contrary to the world's understanding, love is a determination. It's an action of the will. Giving up something of value, giving up ourselves, giving up our lives for Jesus, for others, and to show love through sacrifice. We need to walk it out. God will meet us in this obedience and sacrifice. It's a bit like walking out on the water. You can't do it. You cannot do it. You will sink like Peter did. 
that when you walk out of the water and you walk in faith and you walk in relationship with God and you walk because that's where God wants you to walk, when you step out and you say, I can't love God, I don't feel it, I don't want to, and you step out and say, I will love anyway, I will show love, then God will meet you in that obedience, he will meet you in that sacrifice and he will carry you through. So I know I'm pushing a bit for time, but I want to, I want to stop because I want to use an example of Corrie ten Boom and some of you may have heard it many times before and I've heard it many times, but I could do it again. And I just want us to stop and think, what is it that, that, that God does in our life that even when we can't do it, we step out and he does. You know, put off the old, put on the new, put on the love of Jesus by walking out and letting, doing what he asks us to do, what he commands us to do, and he will meet us at that point. So Corrie ten Boom, a Dutch watchmaker, and they were helping um, Jews from the Nazis and they got arrested and her and her sister Betsy were in a concentration camp in, yeah, ah, in this story from November 1972, the author of The Hiding Place recalls for forgiving a dad at the concentration camp where her sister died, Corrie ten Boom. It was in a church in Munich, this is from her book The Hiding Place, it was a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a grey overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filling out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947 and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed out land and I gave them my favourite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far away from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in silence collected their wraps, in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him walking his way toward, forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the centre of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man, I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. <coughs> Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück, concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good is it to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea? And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner amongst those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was my first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, you were saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. 
I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were also able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. And having thus learned to forgive in the hardest of these situations, I never again had difficulty in forgiving. I wish I could say it. I wish I could say that merciful and charitable thoughts just flowed naturally from me from then on. But they didn't. If there's one thing I've learned at 80 years of age is that I can't store up good feelings and behaviour, but can only draw them fresh from God each day. Maybe I'm glad it's that way. For every time I go to him, he teaches me something else. I recall the time some 15 years ago when some Christian friends whom I loved and trusted did something which hurt me. You would have thought, having given the, forgiven the Nazi guard, that this would have been child's play. It wasn't. For weeks I seethed inside, but at last I asked God again to work his miracle in me. And again it happened. First the cold-blooded decision, then the joy, the flood of joy and peace. I had forgiven my friends. I was restored to my father. Then why was I suddenly awake in the middle of the night, hashing over the whole affair again? My friends, I thought, people I loved. If it had been strangers, I wouldn't have minded so. I sat up and switched on the light. Father, I thought it was all forgiven. Please help me to do it. But the next night, I woke up again. They, they'd talked so sweetly to, never a hint of what they were planning. Father, I cried in alarm, help me. His help came in the form of a kindly Lutheran pastor to whom I confessed my failure after two sleepless weeks. Up in that church tower, he said, nodding out the window, is a bell which is rung by pulling on a rope. But you know what? After the sexton lets go of the rope, the bell keeps on swinging, first ding, then dong, slower and slower until it's fine, the final dong, and then it stops. I believe the same thing is true of forgiveness. When we forgive someone, we take our hand off the rope, but if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, we mustn't be surprised if the old angry thoughts keep coming for a while. They're just the ding-dongs of the old bell slowing down. I'm going to leave it there. There's more, there's more in it. She was the one taken captive, but what was she captive to? Are we captive to our past, our feelings of hurt and offence? Are we unwilling to lay down our life, to, to give up our rights? No one would have condemned her for a lack of forgiveness. No one here, no one on earth, probably. But she learned to lay down the rights of self. She learned to give up the justification of her own actions. She learned to open up to God. She learned that even though she didn't feel like putting out her hand, that she trusted that she just did this and God would do the rest. And God did, does. When we step out in love, when we step to be the community that God asks us to be, sometimes there's a lot of don'ts that block our thinking. But all this we need to do is step out in obedience and sacrifice and let him do the rest. Let him take over our thoughts. Let him take over our feelings. Let him take over our attitudes. Let him take over our behaviours so that we may be the community that he asks us to be. 
you know, we're going to be singing a song next and, and I know coming down the uh, front can be cliche, but I think it's a time where you make, I want to make a decision. But it also brings you forward so other people who are trickling out can go while you have people to pray. If you feel that you should pray with someone, please go and pray because God is stirring up in our hearts to be the community he called us to be, to live a life worthy of the manner of Christ, of the life that Christ gave to us, that he gave his only son. In, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to, to Christ. People ask, when do I forgive? There was a pastor who said, this is my answer to that question. When do you want to be free? When do you want to be free? When do you want to say, when God says love, when do you want to be free to say, I will step out and God will lead me in love? This is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If God is moving in your heart today, start by praying with someone. Start by talking to someone. If it's something on your heart, confess to someone. If you need to go to someone and say, please forgive me, please do that. Let something stir in our heart and God provoke actions of love. If you need to go to someone and express a message of love today, don't hold back. If God is urging you to stand up for something, don't sit down. If God is causing you to rise up, don't lie down. If God is causing you to be energised, don't be stagnant. If God is asking you to do something today, step in out in obedience and watch him move. That's what he wants to do. He wants us to walk. But he wants to do it with us and in us and for us to his glory. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, you speak to us through many people's lives. You speak to us through the church community. You speak to us personally through your word. Lord, you just desire a relationship as Father, that you do it in so many different ways. You want to do it so intimately. You want to transform us. You want to transform us with other people. You want us to have love for one another, where we trust one another, where we, we just desire to give out. Like we're not storing up our money. We want to get money to give out. And Lord, I just thank you that you have a heart to give to us, that you gave everything of your life to us that you didn't have a home, that you, you went to the cross, that you gave it all. Lord, start something in us today. Let us step out in obedience in your name.